So what, what I'd like to do, as um, Kevin said, I'm an engineer. So I started out life as a mathematician. Um, I'm now an engineer, and I work with lots of real-time systems. We, we take something, we build something, and we get data out of it, and we analyze it, basically. So what I'd like to do is talk about image processing. So image processing, almost everybody does some image processing because everyone takes photos. You can you know, download them into all kinds of um, you know, programs, Photoshop, et cetera, and do all kinds of whizzy things with them. And some of those whizzy things are actually quite sophisticated mathematically. So um, let's, let's start by saying images, just, just to say, images can take many, many forms. So this is actually a scanning electron microscope image. It's not a camera at all. It is actually, you know, the, the head scans over the, the sample, which has to be dead in this case. Um, that's an infrared image. So you have infrared sensors. Some fairly cheap phones now have nice little infrared cameras. This, some of you may, anyone know what that is? Yes, yes. Which, which satellite? <laughs> yes, it's WVAF. So this is looking at the anisotropies in something called a cosmic microwave background. So it's a, it's a false color image. It's not an image. It's put together by lots and lots of satellite data. Very good. Um, this, I won't ask anyone to guess what this is. This is actually an X-ray. It's a scan over a big... 3D printed block of plastic with holes in it. And you get something like this. It's simulate cheese. So the idea is, can we predict where the holes are from a variety of, of projections of our X-ray scan? Okay, so all these are images. And you can use a lot of the, you know, for, for these things, you can use a lot of the techniques, image processing techniques that you, we use for camera images. Okay, so what am I going to do? What I, I love image processing, so what I'd like to do is take you through as much of it as I can, but I've probably got far too many slides, so I might miss things out. We'll see. See how I get on time-wise. So um, basically, I want to do maths on my data. It can be 1D, 2D, 3D. If my signal is continuous, a voltage or a photo or actually a photograph, etc. I have to digitize it. Um, so 1D data sets. I'm going to do quite a bit on 1D data sets because it's easy to understand the maths. And the mathematics actually carries through to images. So what's an example of a 1D data set? Something like this. This is actually a trace. It's a time volume trace of breathing through a, something called a spirometer. So it measures your lung function. Um, 2D data sets, images, clearly, which is basically what I'll be talking about. 3D data sets, which are video. I do a lot of video. So just let me play this. So this is actually an example. So I say th this is a video, so it's a 3D data set. It's actually a 4D data set because this is motion capture data. So each marker on somebody, um, ha so it's a set of a projection of 3D coordinates moving over time. Okay? So I do quite a lot of this. So I would deal with 4D data sets as well. But the mathematics is not that different. So what I'm going to do is look at some of the basic mathematics um, which, by which I can analyze data in, in any dimension. But I'm going to concentrate on images. OK, right, so what I, what I would hope to get through, and I'll say why they're important. So three things I'd like to talk about, quantization, sampling, and some image filtering. Okay, three really important things that you need to know about to process images, if you want to do it at a very basic level, at a kind of research level. And I will get onto this, um, even if I have to skip some other stuff, 
an application which is really exciting. It's some work we're doing with British Cycling. So, I've got any cyclists here? No. Oh, is any me? Oh, well, okay. One. <laughs> um, yeah, I am. I'm quite quite keen on, on cycling. And I do a lot of sports applications, and this is a really fun application of um, image processing. So, let's start with quantization. So, how many levels do I need to um, express my data? So, let's start in 1D, because 1D, it's really easy. So, let me give you a whole load of numbers. And let me plot them. So again, this is a spirometer, this is a real spirometer trace. I just breathe in through uh, um, the spirometer and check the volume over time. Um, so my, my levels on my y-axis are 0.00001, okay? So my curve looks fairly smooth. So let's plot that same data with levels of 0.01. Right, still, for those of you at the back, it probably looks the same. Those of you at the front, you can see it's a little bit coarser. Let's plot it with 0.1. Okay, very coarse indeed. So, and my level, you know, this would be 0.2, this would be 0.2, that would be 0.2, etc. I just have to put it in a bin. And if my bin is big, I get a coarse representation. So, for this, to start with, we have to look um, at our data. This is an example of quantization. We have to look at the data and say, well, how much detail do I need to see in my data? Uh, and how many levels do I need in order to express my data? So, precisely the same thing happens with images. So, let's look at Lena. You might get a bit sick of Lena, but it's a very good um, image processing picture because it's got flat bits, it's got bits of detail in, it's got a face. So if anything goes wrong with the eyes, the nose, or the mouth, your eye picks it up very quickly. So this picture of Lena has 256 gray levels. So I go from black to white, and I have 256 levels of different shades of gray. And 256 is 2 to the 8, so I call it an 8-bit image. Pretty good. Your eye thinks that's a good image. So let me wind it down to 64 gray levels, so two to the six, so it's a six-bit image. Yeah, pretty good again. Again, those at the back probably can't tell anything at all. It looks the same. Let's wind it down again to 16. Now, not, this is not many gray levels, so it's four bits. So now, again, the back, it may look the same, you're st but at the front, you're starting to see um, a, a sort of granularity. So, not great. Let's go to four levels, okay? Of course, still perfectly recognizable, but more like some stylized, you know, picture, some, something someone's actually photoshopped. So, what I need to do is really think about what my images need, how many bits they need, how many levels. So, general rule of thumb, eight bits or two, five, six gray levels is good enough for almost all monochrome images. Microscopes and X-ray scanners tend to spit out 12 or 16 bits. So, basically, the more bits you have, the more storage, the more processing, so really what you'd like to do is have as few bits as you can get away with. So eight bits is generally what you would have if you download an image from um, the web, etc. Okay, so quantization is important. The next thing which is important, sampling. So sampling, I said I had to digitize my image, so what do I do? So let's go back to 1D because it's much easier to explain in 1D and we'll find that the 2D explanation is precisely the same. So this is, for those of you who know, is a sine wave. Okay, for those of you who don't, it is a, called a sine wave, Y equals sine X. Now, this has a frequency, 
and the higher the frequency, the more this wave oscillates. Now, okay, so suppose I've got a continuous wave, and I want, I want to put this into my computer, so I want to sample it. So what do I do? I want an analog to digital converter, and I have to tell it when to take its samples. So suppose I say, right, just take them. Keep on taking your samples very close together. So I get something like this, so my blue dots are my samples. Then suppose I took those samples and told you, draw a sine wave through those samples, okay? So you would draw, the most likely thing you would draw is the original sine wave. But you could draw a sine wave that oscillated like mad in between each sample point and still went through all the points, okay? So, as long as I say, no, you're not allowed these very high oscillations, there's only one sine wave you can draw through those points, okay? So, but then again, I'm sampling a lot, and it's a lot of samples, it's a lot of storage, it's a lot of processing. So, okay, but it will work. Now, suppose I net that sample at what more widely spaced intervals. So my blue points now, so sine wave again, my blue points are my samples. So now if I told you to draw a sine wave through that, well, you might draw this original sine wave, the sine wave it was sampled from, but you might draw that, which is a sine wave at half the frequency, okay? Oscillates more slowly. So there's a problem. If I sample too far apart, I can draw lots of sine waves through it and I'm not going to be able to reproduce my original signal. So, what are we gonna do? If I sample densely, I can reconstruct the signal, but I've got lots of data. If I sample sparsely, I can fit more than one wave through it. So the answer, and there's a nice page or two of maths that goes with this, is there is an optimal sampling frequency. It's called the Nyquist frequency and tells me that I can reconstruct, tells me how to sample in order to reconstruct my signal with a minimum of redundancy, i.e. I don't have to sample all, you know, very closely spaced intervals. And the answer is I sample at, twi at greater than twice the biggest frequency in the signal. So if I sample at twice the biggest frequency, I have the minimum amount of data it needs I need to reconstruct my signal. This is really important. So, and when it goes wrong, it goes wrong in a big way. So we'll, ha we'll have a look at that. So, re so as I say, there's several nice pages of maths here, but hopefully you understand the basic idea of, of how to sample. Um, so precisely the same considerations apply, apply to images. So let me give you a, uh, 756 by 622 brick wall, exciting picture. Okay, so hopefully that looks good enough to you. It looks like a, a nice brick wall without artifacts. So let me downsample that brick wall and hopefully all of you can see that I've immediately got these ringing artifacts or fringes, okay? So that is a function, that we call this aliasing, and it means that I have, some, I have not sampled at more than twice the biggest frequency in the image because this image contains a lot of high frequency data. I'll talk about what frequencies are in images in a minute. Now, let me do that again. I've sampled, downsampled by three, but I've done something to my image beforehand. So now, you should see the artifacts look a lot better, but the, um, the image is just slightly blurred, okay? So, so how, we need to ask how that pre-processing works, okay? So what it is, is you take your image and you just smooth it slightly, you blur it. I'll talk about smoothing. So you blur your image a little bit and that removes high frequencies. 
So that makes it easier to sample at a lower rate without introducing these aliasing artifacts. Um, a lot of cameras, a lot of digital cameras, if you've got a digital camera, you will have something, you may have something called an anti-aliasing filter actually in front of the sensor that does a little bit of blurring to remove aliasing artifacts. And semi-professional cameras, you can actually take that out and go for the really sharp picture um, and a bit of aliasing, a bit of the ringing. Now, I've been saying, okay, frequency is an image. Well, it's easy to think of a 1D signal because, you know, we, we, we listen to music, the speech, and we can know high frequencies and low frequencies. So what, what are frequencies in an image? So let's, let's have a look. So suppose I tell you that this is a two-dimensional sine wave. So if I was in, if I plotted a sort of 3D picture of it, it would go like that, where the sine wave is in that vertical direction, okay? Now, I'm going to, clearly, that's a sine wave. I would expect to have frequencies in the vertical direction. It's a perfect sine wave, it has one frequency, it oscillates at one frequency. So, if I plot the frequencies, I'll say a bit more about this in a minute. So, suppose this is my origin, my horizontal frequency is there, and my vertical frequency is there. I get two, a sort of plus and a minus frequency. Don't worry too much about the minus. That's the maths, okay? Exactly what I'd expect. Now, if I take my sine wave, but I make it oscillate a little more quickly down here, and then more gradually up here, what I'd expect is, which one of those? So, if this, if these are the points on the previous graph where the, the original frequency was, which one of those do you think I'll get? Any offers? Have a guess. C, yes. Yeah, because if these are the frequencies, I've made the still vertical frequencies, but they've been, the, now it, the image contains higher frequencies. So in this frequency plane, it gets stretched out like that. Exactly, which is like this. So now, I can give you another image, which is like a, a vertical sine wave and some diagonal sine. My frequencies are like this. Now, I stretch that, and I stretch out my frequencies. So this frequency in an image is telling me the sort of um, content, of my frequency content in horizontal and vertical directions, the detail in my image, basically, okay? If I look at my brick wall, what I get is this wonderful thing, okay? And purely from frequencies in an image, you can do lots and lots of image processing. You can reconstruct the shape of surfaces from fre the frequencies in a homogeneous um, pattern surface. So let's just continue on this for a minute. So, so basically, my parts of my image which have high, with lots of detail, will give high frequencies. Smoother parts of the image will give low frequencies. That's what you need to think. Um, now, frequencies. Frequencies have an amplitude, a frequency, and a phase. No, waves, not frequencies. Um, so, if I have my sine wave, it has an amplitude, it has a frequency, and if I shift it along, I do a phase shift. Okay, so I can combine, for those of you who've done complex numbers, you know you can combine amplitude, um, frequency and phase into a complex number. And basically what those graphs were that I was plotting were, the, were these complex number representations of my image, which are called Fourier transforms, okay? And this is 
you get a lot of insight into images by thinking about um, frequencies and phases. So let's go back to Lena. Okay, so I'm going to do a Fourier transform of Lena. And I've got a, complex, a set of complex numbers. I'm going to set, I'm going to throw away the frequencies and phases. I am going to set all the phases to um, zero, basically, and just reconstruct Lena using the amplitudes of those complex, complex numbers. And it gives me complete nonsense, you know, not, nothing useful. You couldn't see Lena from, from that. Now, I take my set of complex numbers and I throw, don't throw away the amplitudes, I'll set all the amplitudes to one or the same thing. And I reconstruct my original image, I get this. So immediately you can see that all the information in this image, almost all the information, is contained in these frequencies and phases because it's edges. The most important thing about, edge, about images are edges. It's edges that give all the Low frequencies, high frequencies, low detail, high detail. Okay? So this was um, throwing away the frequencies, this is throwing away the amplitudes. And because edges are really the most important things in two dimensional, to our eye, we pick out edges. If we're able to pick out edges, we can, we can reconstruct the image. We can pick out exactly what that image means. Okay. So, I talked a little bit before about smoothing images. So, um, smoothing images is effectively putting some blur over them. It's getting rid of high frequencies, like these bits, okay? So, how do I do that? So, if I, I'll tell you how we do it in a minute. If I blur Lena a little bit, she would look like that. If I blur her even more, should look very fuzzy indeed. So what am I doing when you can do this in, your, in Photoshop, etc. you can smooth, you can apply smoothing um, operations. And what this is, is it's always a process called convolution. So in order to say what this is, I'm gonna go back to 1D again. Convolution's tough for, for those, um, we well, don't see it at school and at university, it's kind of a hard thing to, to do the maths for, but understanding it is quite easy. So suppose I have three numbers. I'll call them a filter. A six, a third, a six. So I get my filter. I have a big set of numbers here and I pass it through. So I place the central one on this pixel and I multiply them all and add them up. So nothing there, nor times one over six, three times one over three, plus three times one over three, plus two times one over six, so 1.3. And I replace the three by 1.33. And I just put this through here and keep doing that, okay? And what this does, if I do something like that to this image, a noisy signal, it smooths it out, okay? If I do it again, it smooths it out even more. Now, for those of you who can see who aren't, <laughs> aren't that many, probably, I've actually changed the amplitude on this, which is not great. And so, when I'm choosing my filter, I should try to choose it so that I don't alter the amplitude. This is just a little example, um, but I would generally choose a longer filter and something which summed to one, okay? So that's what you're doing when you smooth um, 1D data. Now, if I want to do that with an image, I would normally take a Gaussian, so this two-dimensional Gaussian function, a normal curve in two dimensions, and I would place that again, I place the center of that Gaussian on each pixel of my image, I multiply and sum it all up, replace that pixel with the result. And I slide it across the whole image, every pixel, and that smooths it out. So when I'm smoothing my images, I'm generally applying something that we call a Gaussian blur. Um, right, so, 
filtering, this is um, basically doing something like that, convolving with some shape is generally called filtering. So you're filtering your image. Um, I can do it in 1D, 2D, and higher dimensions. Um, now, I said there was a Gaussian in 2D, but it can, you can design filters to have all kinds of um, outcomes. That Gaussian, because it got rid of the high frequencies, was called a low-pass filter because it lets the low frequencies pass. And I can design filters to do other things. I can get rid of low frequencies, so it would be a high pass. I can do edge detection. I can get rid of high and low frequencies, so it's band pass. I just let frequencies in a certain band. So I can do all kinds of filter design, okay? And it's generally having some sort of uh, shape which I pass over my image, I convolve. Okay, so how am I doing? Yeah, okay, so I wanted, so we've got the, we need to know about quantization, we need to know about sampling, we know about filtering is passing some things across. I want to look at just two, before going to an application, I want to look at two other um, operations. So one is really simple, thresholding, but used so much. So thresholding. So if I've got my image, normally it's just got too much, too much information in it. I want to make it simpler. I sometimes want to make it simpler before I operate on it, or I want to make it simpler after I've operated on it. And thresholding is a really easy operation. So I would basically just say, well, here's my image. I'll set everything over some value. My pixels have intensities to one, up to black, and I'll set everything below that to white. Okay, so I get this binary image. But extremely useful in all, and it's often, a, one stage in, a, in an image processing pathway. Problem is, it's not without risk, because choosing your threshold, you may choose it for one set of images, you know, I'll show you a bit later um, some examples, and then it won't work for anything else, even though it's the same sort of image. So thresholding often has, you know, you, you need some correct and robust way of determining it. And you can often do that from the data. You determine your threshold by looking at the properties of your image. Okay, so that's thresholding. One other really nice, so this is the second image operation, is called morphological. They're morphological operators. So morphological operators, they combine filtering and thresholding. Um, and as you might think, it's all to do with processing shapes. So, um, the two, I won't go into too much detail here, but the two basic procedures are erosion and dilation. And they're, they're really easy to explain. If you write them down, you have all kinds of set theory, but very easy to actually explain. Let me show you. So erosion is gonna remove pixels from my image. So let's take a black and white image and let me erode with a three by three square. So I put my three by three square at center it on, I can't center it on the outside, but I can here. So suppose it's centered here. If every pixel is one, then I replace it with one, otherwise I replace it with zero. So in here, if my three by three goes there, this one is okay, this one is okay, and that one is okay. So all I'm left with is this. And if I do the same with this, I remove a lot of the boundary of my binary um, image. Now this can be done fairly quickly um, and is extremely useful. So that's erosion. The other thing, as you might suspect, is now is making it bigger, so it's dilation. And this is to fill in gaps. So, sorry, I should have said, erosion, of course, will get rid of lots of noise in my image. I've got lots of little blobs of stuff that I know is noise, I don't want it. I can erode very quickly and get rid of it. 
So dilation is different, so I put, again, three by three block, slide it along the image. I, if my three by three block contains at least one one, I replace everything in that block by one, okay? So it's a way of filling in gaps. And again, it's incredibly useful. I think most, pro most programs will also have, most programs which you can operate on images on will have these functions. So, okay, so I've, I think I've talked about almost everything I wanted to kind of illustrate on this example. So I can now get onto my example, and it's track cycling. So thanks here, go to Tony Pennell, head of technology for British cycling, Stuart Bennett, who's my postdoc, who works for Briti who works with me for British Cycling, Peter Curry and Duncan Barber, are two fourth-year engineers who are doing um, aspects of cycling work as their projects. Now. What do we want to do? Cycling is the most techno technologically advanced sport, I think I'm right in saying. Um, I, I mean, I'm Olympic sport. I'm not including Formula One. In fact, Tony came straight from Formula One to British Cycling. So, what do you do? We've got amazing bikes. We've got amazing skin suits. We've got amazing helmets. We've got power meters on the bike. We've got everything. What, what's left? Right? Desperately, we want to win more goals in Rio, and they're even looking forward to Tokyo now. So the idea is to give ourselves a competitive advantage. So has anyone got, got an idea of what one of the most important things is in cycling? Apart from being big and strong and fit. Any idea? but it's aerodynamics. It plays a massive, massive part in running, aerodynamics doesn't matter, a lot of low velocity sports, cycling, it's big. So, we have, they all had a think and they thought, right, what can we, where can we make our gains? We can look at the posture of elite athletes because we can, before, before the hour record that Bradley Wiggins did, um, he went round and round and round the velodrome in Manchester trying to keep the ideal position, okay? He's a master at putting his body into the most aerodynamic shape. Other cyclists aren't. So, what we, they do is they go, they, what they've done for a long time, is so they go to the wind tunnel, they get on the bike, they look at the drag, and they look at the power output, et cetera, and they say, right, this is your perfect position. I'll draw it for you, right? You have to keep that position because your drag goes down by 6%, and that's, you know, that will win you a medal. Um, however, when they, get in a wind when they get on the track, it all goes to pot, and nobody knows, actually, you know, are they in that position? Where's it going wrong? You know, they're not producing the same, um, drag measurements as they did in the wind tunnel. So what we wanted to do was to turn the velodrome into a wind tunnel. So we wanted to give them a qualitative output so they can see a really good picture of a static cyclist going around the track. And we wanted some quantitative output. So what is the drag? Can I look at the drag by looking at the frontal area um, that cyclist is presenting? Because the frontal area is what it's all about. So, this is the aim. This is the velodrome at Manchester. This is Tony. Uh, this is one of the teams that's just come off. The, the aim is to do your session. Um, you come off, you analyze that session. You have everything up. We, we, we have to do it in real time. We have to do it in practically real time. Um, um, they go and they say, right, okay. Because they've got the measurements from the bikes, etc. You know, the, the power output. And we want to try and, you know, use this as a training tool. So, cycling, what have we got? Raw data, we have cameras which are 1920 by 1080 pixels, 50 frames a second, four milliseconds exposure because they're traveling very fast, so we don't want blur. 
uh, f over 13 aperture, which basically means we want, a huge, we want a large depth of field. So we want it to be pretty much in focus when it's a long way away. And we want a pretty big image sensor because the velodrome can be quite dark and they don't want to turn the lights up all the time. So <clears throat> this is, for the example I'm showing you now, going to show you now, that's, th these are our cameras. And we have two of them, one looking down each of the straights. So let me just show you what the data looks like. Okay. So we have stacks and stacks and stacks of data of people going around like this. The, um, all, the, all the elite cyclists have RFIDs on their bike and they have timing loops so you know exactly who's going through, who's on the track, who's going through where, when. Um, so this is the data, okay? Now, one of the things we want to do is the cyclists there, there, and there. What we would like to do is actually put that together so you see the cyclist as though he's the same distance away all the time. So you can really study it, and we can do some maths on it. So we need to find the cyclists in each frame. We need to scale each frame's cyclists to the same height. I need to then align one frame to the next because it's no good if it doesn't, doesn't look smooth. And I also need to do it quickly, preferably in 50 milliseconds, less than 50 milliseconds before the next frame comes in, okay? So I want to do all my image processing quickly. I have got quite a lot of computer power I can throw at it if I want to. Um, so what do we do? We've got to do something kind of quick and dirty. So we try to find the front tire. If I can find the front tire, I can align it. I can tell where it is on the track. I can scale it. I can do a lot. If I can accurately find that tire. So what do we try? Well, let's, let's try threshold in it because your tire's black. Yeah, it's not too bad. But actually, when I threshold, I get all kinds of other things in the picture. I get tires, I get the sponges with Manchester written all over them, I get the black distance line, and I get the finish line as well. And sometimes your tires aren't black. Um, <clears throat> so we can try thresholding. But the answer here is we have to do a whole sort of range of image processing. So I can try looking at motion. I can say, right, the track doesn't change color, but my wheel is changing, I'm sorry, it doesn't change position, but my wheel changes position. So suppose I subtract my one frame from my frame five frames ago, take the absolute value of that. High absolute value means it's changed, so there's some motion. Use that with my threshold intensity, and I get, if you can see it, I don't know if you see it at the back, you know, I get rid of a lot of the extraneous stuff, and I get a kind of blob where the cyclist is. So now, let's dilate. So I take that blob, I do a morphological mapping, so I fill in the gaps, so I get a, a nice big blob. Then I can take that blob, I know that's my cyclist, go back to the original image and look in more detail at the wheel region, okay? And all these operations are pretty quick. Oh, but when you look at that, you get this shadow. Oh. So the shadow and the problem with the shadow is it moves with the rider. It, it's, you know, you, you, your image processing algorithm thinks it's uh, motion. That black line looks a bit like a wheel, so we get a lot of confusion, okay? So what do we do now? Well, what we can do now is we could actually do a convolution, choose a, a filter. We know pretty much how thick the tire is, so we choose a filter, we'll go into the details of this, to pick out the wheel, okay? So provided the cyclists have black wheels, we can do it 99% of the time. Sometimes things go a bit wrong, but it's, it's completely robust now. 
So we've got, we've got that sorted out. So let me just show you what it looks like now. And, and amazingly, we can log on in Cambridge to the velodrome at Manchester and see people riding around. It's really nice. So that is what you can come, so you come off the bike and you can look at yourself, okay? So this is, the, the coaches love this actually, because they can say, oh, look, you know, your elbow's coming out, your shoulder's going down, your head's coming up. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned, because it would take me a little while, we have side view cameras as well. So we can play the side view at the same time as the front view, which, is, which gives them a lot more information. So, that's good. Um, works, works pretty well now, 99% of the time. Uh, but we need something a bit more quantitative. And so now, we, but we've now got a bit more time. They want that immediately. We've, we now can have a few minutes of processing time when we say, actually, we're just gonna give you something else. Uh, and they're quite happy with that. We do some more, some much more advanced image processing to get something like this. And I'll show you what, I'll just explain, I'll run this and explain what it is. So basically, we have our scale view of the cyclist. We segment it, so we remove all the background. Remove all the background and basically count the pixels so we get the frontal area. And then we can give them a graph of frontal area. So I know that there's a little dot here, but you probably can't see it. It's going along this graph. Something happened here, maybe put his elbows out, et cetera, which messed up his aerodynamics. So we can also look at this um, and compare it with drag measurements, which are coming off the bike. And we can tell them to go round and round until that thing is straight, okay? You may notice there's a few problems here. So we're gradually sorting this out. This is not, not easy. Um, but so we, they have this and they also have a side view. So they have the side view and they can see what they look like from the side. Because if your head comes up a bit, then normally your back changes and your shoulders change. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of work is going into this analysis of cyclists because it's where you can make the most gain given that everyone has caught up with us on the materials, the, the um, training, the composition of the bike, etc. Okay, so um, that, was, that was really where I wanted to get to. I'm just going to also say that there's massive amounts of um, image processing that I've left out. And of course, I've left out the whole field, which is absolutely fascinating, of color processing and perception. So a little example, you can just down, you can see this on the web, that squares A and B are actually precisely the same intensity. Okay? So our vision, um, how, how we perceive intensity depends on what's around it. Okay? And you can get lots of really interesting um, uh, examples of this. So image processing, not the, not the sort of image processing I do, but a lot of image processing has to take in, um, has to take perception into account as well. Because if we're looking at it, we perceive, um, you know, what we perceive in some part of the image depends on what's around it. And if I'm, image, if I'm looking at image coding, for example, if my coding, like your, you see in your television, when it goes wrong, you get blocks everywhere. If I get some errors and they're around my mouth, forget it, you know, it, it looks awful. If it's around some top of the image where there's not much going on, it doesn't matter. So your errors have to be sort of related to perception as well. Okay, so I think that's probably all I have to say. And questions? If, if. Right, I, I don't know if uh, somebody got the microphone yet, I don't know where they...
A bit is a bit. Oh, they got them already. Good, good, good. So, has anybody got any questions? Uh, so, uh, modern cameras are able to, to pick out faces from images. Is that does that use similar technology or? So, which cameras? Uh, modern digital cameras will will show you where the faces are in, yeah. in the photo. Yeah. You're taking. So, most I mean, face detection is a massive field. So, there's a there's a really um, simple face detector called Viola Jones face detector and uses something called a hard transform, which is very quick to implement. And most digital cameras, I think, do this Viola Jones um, transform to pick out faces. At the, there are lots more, because um, if you turn sideways, it fails, of course. So there are more sophisticated techniques, but they need more, more processing power. Yeah, so it doesn't use any of, it uses a transform, uh, a filter, but a very specific type of filter. Yeah. What is it about the face that that, that transform picks out? Is it, is it just human faces it, it works on? Like, what aspect of the face is it that is detected? Mainly your eyes and your mouth. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically what it's looking for. Yeah. It's, it's looking for... Um, change, because generally they're darker than your face. Um, so it's looking for sort of ch step changes. And it does a really good job. Because there's not many things that have two eyes. You can fool it quite easily, but it has two eyes and a mouth there. <laughs> so it's that simple. Right. Um, I was just wondering about that picture you showed of the, the, the person with the, the face. And I think on one of them you said you got rid of the, was it the frequency and the phase and you could see the edges. And the other one was it you... Or was it you kept the amplitude? I can't remember the way around. One of them seemed to like just have a, a kind of a pattern in it, but it was basically nonsense, not related to the original image. What, what, what did it actually represent, what you could see there? Like what? So, um, I mean, it, it, it's astonishing, quite astonishing. I remember first, when I first did this, so you get your image, you do a Fourier transform. Do you know what a Fourier transform is? Uh, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so you do a Fourier transform, you get a set of complex numbers, you set all the, so it's, you know, the amplitudes of those complex numbers are just, you know, they're giving you some of the kind of contrast in the image, but they're not giving you any of the detail at all. So it is telling you something about how the image, um, you know, how the intensities in the image are distributed, but it's really not telling you anything which would able, enable you to reconstruct it without the phases. So it's important, but I was trying to do that to illustrate that phases are, you know, uh, the frequencies, stroke phases, are the absolute most important thing that your eye picks out. We've got, I mean, people think that we've got, you know, our brain works with special filters which, you know, are looking for directional edge detectors. Um, so... So it's giving you some information, because of course, I would need that to reconstruct the original. But on its own, it gives us almost nothing. Uh, related to the previous question, so if you get rid of uh, a face, what will happen then? So if I, if I set all, you know, because I've got a, a complex number like R, E to the I, something. If I set the somethings to zero, so I just get the... Um, amplitude and inverse Fourier transform, I get that first picture which is just useless in the sense of not picking out the most important things. It's giving, as I said, it's giving you some information but not the important information that our brain needs to process the images. It's a, diff it's a difficult one, this, because you know, I remember being stunned the first time I saw how important phase was in an image. It's very different from sound. It's quite different from sound, where amplitude is very important. Just an idea that, is it possible that the, the image that looks nonsense to us could therefore be used as some sort of data encryption of images well, yeah. in a way that... Of course, yeah. Because yeah. you do need that to reconstruct the entire image. Yeah. So, but you've, you know, um, very... It's difficult. So if I just gave you that, 
I could, you know, I've lost so much of the detail, I couldn't reconstruct it. Whereas I gave you the phases only, then you could mess around with amplitudes and have a go. But you could certainly perhaps use it in some form of, uh, in some sense, yeah. And people do use transform coefficients in a variety of, you know, compression or of things like that. Okay, well, um, I think um, we should thank Joan again for such a, a great talk. And <laughs> <laughs>